Do keep uh, Romans 7 open. Uh, Phoebe asked us the question as, uh, as she read Romans 7 to us. What questions sprang into your mind as the second half of Romans 7 was being read to us? I'll give my answer a little bit later on, but my guess is that a number of you would have asked, is Paul speaking about the Christian experience or the pre-Christian experience? And I think that's a fair question, given where we have come from so far in Romans. Back in chapter 6 in verse 18, it's the Christian who has died with Christ, has been set free from sin and enabled to become slaves of righteousness. And then together in our chapel last Friday, from chapter 7, we read that death brings an end to all former relationships so that the Christian is free to bear fruit for God. And then in the reading that Phoebe just brought us a moment ago in those almost unreadable verses, verse 15, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Or down in verse 19, I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. As we read those words, it seems that this must be about the pre-Christian because that's their experience. And it's summed up in verse 18. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, is in, in my sinful nature. It has to be before you're a Christian that this is written. But... As it was being read to us, didn't you feel that this resonates so much with your experience of the Christian life as well? That is, you want to honour God, but fail each day. And in verse 18, the second half of that verse that I started reading a moment ago, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. And so it does seem that this is the experience of the Christian, the one who wants to live for Jesus but just falls short. So is it the Christian or is it the pre-Christian? Answering that question is actually not what Paul is trying to do here. He, what he's doing here is, the, is he's exploring the reality of the coexistence in the one being of both the flesh and the spirit. Because today's chapter introduces us to the word sarkikos, that is the word fleshy. In chapter six, in the first part of chapter seven, Paul wasn't talking about that. He was working through the place of the law. And the conclusion is the law is good. It is God's good law, he has given it. And in this second half of chapter seven, he examines how that good law works in the lives of fleshy people. So he begins our section, our passage, again with a strong affirmation of how, how good the law is. So in verse 13, thinking about the law and what it does to a person, did that which is good then become death to me? The law is good, but it condemns me to death. And he says, by no means. The law is good, but when it operates on the flesh, when the law and the flesh come together, that brings about death. And so I've been trying to think of an illustration of this, and I've worked out it's not easy. But in my weirdness, I get interested in all sorts of things. And over the last 15 years, I've been interested in the wonders of the human body the way that mitochondria start their existence as bacteria, but now they're in every one of our cells to turn food into energy for us. And in more recent years, I've become interested in immunotherapy. And so that's my illustration. <laughs> <laughs> cancer takes hold, oh, by the way, that is a picture of an immune cell attacking a cancer cell. Don't know if it's real, but it's what I found on the internet. <laughs> Cancer takes hold in the human body 
when our bodies fail to see or to fight those alien cancer cells. And immunotherapy is where the body's own immune system is manipulated so that it can see and fight the cancer cells that are previously ignored. Now, immunotherapy doesn't work for all cancers, but for some there's actually a 100% success rate. And in that process of immunotherapy, as the immune system attacks those cancer cells, the person can feel very, very sick indeed because the body becomes a battlefield where the cancer cell by this stage is an integral part of the person. It fights back against the immune system, but eventually it's destroyed. And so you have something within you alerting your body to an alien enemy and fighting against it. That's as close an example as I come up with. So verse 13. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognised as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. You see, for us, sin was invisible. Sin had no name. It was transparent to us. But when the law came, it exposed sin, exposed sin so that it might be destroyed. And it is that time, to use the illustration, the time where death-bringing cells are made obvious and destroyed by life-providing cells. That's what Paul has on view in the second half of chapter 7. It's the time where we are saved, but not yet perfect. As Andrew said as we started chapel this morning, how much refining is still to be done in us. That is our experience. This is our time. It's a time where we are both Christians and at the same time creatures. We are in fact spiritual but also fleshly, where the supernatural work of God is active in destroying that rebellious, wicked, hostile part of us, and yet we are still not what we are called to be nor what we desire to be. It is the experience of every one of us between the day we surrendered to Jesus and the day of his glorious appearance in perfection when we will see him face to face and we will be perfect. It's a time where we know God's good commands in the law but we fall short in our obedience to them. And it's not that the law is bad but because we are creatures, because we are enfleshed beings, in this fleshly state, that magnificent work of God actually takes time. And that's what we see described here in verses 21 to 25. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that's subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my fleshly sinful nature... I'm a slave to the law of sin. Well, that then leads me to my question from this passage, and if you'll indulge me for a moment, my question is, why the delay? Why doesn't God and why didn't God just get rid of our fleshiness the moment we were saved? It'd be much easier for us. I think it would be much better. And the outcome would be 100% effective because we all know people who gave their life to Jesus but as time goes by turned their back on him. If he were to do this straight away, there wouldn't be a problem. And God doesn't give an answer to my question, which shows that my question must be unimportant or my question is stupid. But I know what the answer to my question is not. It is not that God uses this time between our conversion and our glorification for us to prove ourselves to him, 
to show ourselves worthy of his work. Do recall David's summary as he preached to us last Friday. The good law that kills in this age is met with grace and kindness, David said to us. The delay always has the shape of the kindness of God. It is not about our need to show ourselves worthy. And so in some way, this delay, this spiritual fleshy existence that we all share now, has to be for our good. And this is actually the way that God works. He works through time. You see, just step back for a moment and think about it. We live in the overlap of the ages. Now, I assume that God could have blown the full-time whistle on humanity when Jesus came so we didn't need to live in this overlap of the ages. He could have done that, but he chose not to. And this is the existence that we live in. Or back in the garden where the first man and the first woman chose to eat that fruit, if the serpent crusher had come at that time, all of the pain wouldn't have been necessary. But in God's kindness... Jesus came at just the right time. Or as the Apostle Paul says in Galatians, when the time had fully come. And so this is the way that God works. There is a delay in what he is achieving. If you stop and think about even the life of Jesus, why did he go through those 30-something years on earth why didn't he just land on earth, defeat the devil and bring the eternal age immediately? Well, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. He himself suffered when he was tempted, so he's able to help those who are being tempted. Chapter 4, verse 15. For we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every way was tempted just as we are, Yet he didn't sin. And so let us approach God's throne with grace and confidence that, so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Or in chapter 5, verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petition with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learnt obedience from what he suffered. In all of these things we see something in common. We can't answer the why the delay. But we know that the delay, even in the 30-something years of the Lord's life on earth, was painful, but was ultimately for the great glory of God. And secondly, it must be the only way that we sinners can possibly be saved. And so then, so what? What have we learnt from the end of chapter 7? What do we make of all this? Our burning questions haven't been answered by this passage, but the implications for us are immediate and they're also far-reaching and there are three horizons. You can see a picture coming up there. Uh, of a man on a road. When I saw that picture on the internet, I thought, you fool, you're going to get run over by a haulage truck. Uh, but he doesn't seem to be worried about that. But the, but the person who is doing this walk does have three horizons. The first horizon is, where do I put my foot next? The short-term horizon is, making sure you don't get hit by the oncoming traffic while still being close enough to the road so you can eventually make it to civilization. And the long-term horizon, of course, is to get to his destination. Well, I want to think about those three horizons for us and what Romans 7 teaches us. Firstly, our immediate horizon. We do learn about how to live today and how to live tomorrow. Know that you are both spiritual and fleshy, inhabiting the same body. And that has implications for how you think about anything and everything. So for some of us in this room, it's probably many of us in this room, we are perfectionists. And our perfectionism causes us to beat ourselves up over our failings. Now, sin is never accept acceptable. But God is at work making us what we will one day be. 
do remember, brothers and sisters, that you are a work in progress. While he calls us to change, and he calls us to change immediately, he gives us time to change. That's what Romans 7 teaches us. And some of us in this room are nonchalant about our sin. We confuse sin with just being human. And so we excuse the sin and we don't feel the weight of the need to strive and, str strive and struggle for greater holiness. Now, God gives us, each of us, the honour of working beside him in the costly work he did in his son in saving us. And so don't think that holiness and growing in holiness is a trivial thing. One of our graduates, Mike Morrow, wrote a song that we sang in chapel last week that captures this. So I thought I'd read it to you. The first verse is for those of you that are the nonchalant. The second verse is for those of us who are perfectionist. So to the nonchalant amongst us, this life I live is not my own, for my Redeemer paid the price. He took it to be his alone, to be his treasure and his prize. The things of earth I leave behind to live in worship of my King. His is the right to rule my life. Mine is the joy to live for him. And to the perfectionist amongst us, I died to sin upon the cross. I'm bound to Jesus in his death. The old is gone and now I must rely on him for every breath. With every footstep that I tread, what mysteries he has in store. I cannot know what lies ahead, but know that he has gone before. There is the immediate for us. This life is a mixture of fleshiness and spiritual. In the short term, well, in chapter 6 and chapter 8, we are told where we should go in the short term as we lift our gaze beyond the immediate. And in the old-fashioned terms, the, what they say is that we must vivify the spirit and mortify the flesh. I know they're old terms. That is, what life is about as we are fleshy and spiritual, it's that continual putting to death of those things that are sinful, of those things that are wrong, and enlivening and giving life to those works of the Spirit. That's what it keeps saying. So there is the real importance of mortification and vivification. And here is where we have a much better story to tell than our world has, especially in these days of social media, because we live in an age where the past always catches up on you. Something you wrote a decade ago will be used against you. Pictures that you posted when you, came back, when you, when you were young will come back to haunt you. The race or slur that you might have made half a decade ago will always be a black mark against your name. And what our world says is what you once were, you are anchored in and you will always be. And Romans 7 says the old sinful fleshiness is passing. Spirituality is being vivified and holiness is coming to light. Isn't that fantastic news for our world that just keeps wanting to hold people where they already are? The flesh will be mortified, the spirit will be vividly on display and it's empowered and guaranteed by God. How wonderful is that? So the last verse of Mike Morrow's song picks that up. There is a voice that pierced the grave, a power that rolled the stone away, a sound of life. I know I'm saved. The voice of God has called my name. So I will rise and in the air behold the glory of the King. I will not fear to meet him there because I know my life is hid with him. Tomorrow as we read Romans chapter 8, we'll see this wonderful work of the Spirit of God that guarantees those words that are in those songs. The flesh will melt away. The Spirit will, will remain as we meet our Saviour face to face. Let's pray. Our Lord God, while you don't answer, 
all of our questions. Thank you that you tell us something far greater, far grander, that within this fleshy body, you are working absolutely that the flesh might be mortified and the spirit might be vivified. Please enable us every day to put to death the flesh and to give new life and new excitement to the spirit who you put within us. And we thank you so much for the day that will dawn when we meet you in glory as your redeemed, glorified, perfect children. Thank you that that is our guarantee. Amen.